Did it say I was live? Okay, great. So, hey, thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate you coming to, to hear me talk. I know there's a lot of great sessions this afternoon. Um, as I know I asked it, but we got some new people. Is, does anyone have experience already with Vagrant? Just a little bit or? Okay. So this is really just an intro into Vagrant and how to get started. Um, I'm going to kind of walk through what Vagrant is, uh, a little bit about the configuration, uh, and then I'm going to jump into Puffet and how we can use that and kind of modify it uh, later on. Uh, my name is Steve Rhodes. Uh, I live here in Orange County. Uh, I've got three little munchkins that, that keep me super busy. Um, in my free time, I, I do contribute to open source projects. Uh, so I, right now I'm contributing, well, a bunch, but active in Zen Framework uh, and recently React PHP. Uh, I'm a software engineer with Panasonic Avionics. Uh, we're, head, we're headquartered here in uh, Lake Forest. Uh, if you've ever been on a plane with an in-seat monitor like this, the likelihood is it, it was one of our products as we have about a 75% global market share. So just a little bit about Vagrant. Um, Vagrant is a, is a tool that we can use uh, to produce configurable and reproducible uh, environments. Uh, in addition, we can distribute that configuration. It helps us solve some problems. So staying in sync. At Panasonic, we have a very large engineering department. Uh, and within those engineering departments, there's times where we may need to share particular environments or even within, within an existing team of a large number of developers. Uh, in addition, we have a, a deployment process that starts with the local development. So developers will do their testing on their machine. And then we have what we call our staging environment, which was a, it's an integration machine that the developers access. We kind of update that and, and work against that collaboratively. We then transition into a pre-production environment, and inevitably we end up on production. Uh, very recently, we had something come up where we're running PHP 5.3 on production, and we're trying to roll out an upgrade to PHP 5.4. And as soon as we start rolling out that 5.4 uh, upgrade to production, we're going to start with 5.5. I don't know if you guys knew this, but last week PHP 5.6 was released. Uh, and so our big push to kind of stay at the tip of, of the PHP world uh, is going to continue. So that introduces some really interesting challenges. Um, one is that we, we have to continue to support PHP 5.3 as we're doing all of our integration against 5.4. Uh, locally, we may switch our environments to, to 5.4, but if a, a bug gets raised on production, somehow we've yet, we need to be able to switch back to 5.3. And, and manage those changes. So Vagrant really helps us in, in that regard. Uh, the whole it works on my machine problem. Uh, if you've been developing long enough, I'm sure you've heard it more than once. It's very common for people that are developing on Mac and Windows and are deploying to Linux environments. So the PHP autoloader will fail to load a class if you have case issues, case sensitivity issues. Um, it's often hard to debug because it comes back as class not found. Well, it's the class is in the proper case. Like, I don't understand. The class is there, right? I, I can't tell you the countless number of hours that I've spent debugging autoloader issues, forgetting the fact of this case insensitivity stuff. Working with new hires. So we, get, we don't get new hires very often, but when we do, the typical process is here's your shiny new laptop. Right here's some link to our our environment page on a wiki, and you know spend the next week or whatever it takes read the wiki understand our our environment get your development tools set up so on and so forth. The the open source community is a big one. Um, right now with Zen Framework we're we're still supporting PHP 5.3 5.4 5.5 5.6 and now HHVM uh, HHVM is still you know, we're allowing fails on HHVM. I don't think we're supporting it officially yet. But the fact of the matter is, is we have all these different environments that we need to test again, against. Um, and so when we're 
doing testing or we're pushing commits and we see problems on, on Travis CI, you know, we, we need to be able to have a reproducible way to go in and fix any issues across those PHP versions. Uh, I recently, within the, within the last couple days, had pushed a commit into uh, React, working on some uh, an event loop that supports the, the uh, libex uh, extension and ran into some issues with, with the extension itself segfaulting on PHP 5.6. Um, so I had to spin up a, a Vagrant instance and do some compilations, and I was able to, to manage that relatively easily uh, in that way. So Vagrant was started by a, a really cool guy, Mitchell Hashimoto. Um, he's kind of this self-described automation fanatic. And he started it as a side project, believe it or not, in 2010. Um, in 2012, he started a company around it, and it started becoming a little bit more mainstream, providing services and education around Vagrant and automation, especially DevOps-related automation. Uh, I didn't start. I didn't hear about Vagrant for the first time until probably mid 2013, and since I discovered it. I haven't really looked back. Um, you can usually get help on the, the Vagrant IRC channel on Freenode. So if you, for whatever reason, have any issues in, let's say, deploying to the cloud or something like that, you can oftentimes get immediate feedback on their IRC channel. Uh, unfortunately for us, Vagrant's written in Ruby and not PHP. I would have preferred PHP, but uh, still it's a great, it's a great product and, and I'll live with Ruby. <laughs> That's true. Uh, getting started with Vagrant is super easy. They provide an installer for the major OS versions. Uh, you can get it for Windows and, and, and uh, OS X and, and Linux. So it doesn't take very long to download the binary and get up and running. Uh, once you have it, Vagrant supports VirtualBox by default. Does, does anyone work with VirtualBox today to do their virtualizations? Great. So what's great about that is that you can leverage your existing virtual machines in VirtualBox to create what's called a, a base box within Vagrant. And really that's just a box that Vagrant understands how to do something with and you can distribute that. The, uh, the way that you do that is you run this Vagrant package command, you need to make sure and give it the double hyphen base, and you'll pass it the name of that you've given it in, uh, in your virtual box. And if, you, if you don't know what that name is, it's usually on the left-hand column of the GUI. You know, there, there is some name that sits there that, that you can look at. The caveats are that you have to have guest editions installed, and that's pretty easy to do, and it must be using a NAT network adapter. So I have some, some local VMs that are using some private IP-based stuff, and I'm a little frustrated right now that I can't turn those into to Vagrant boxes. So running this command, it takes a while, depending on the size of your virtual machine. So I would suggest doing that, and then going and getting a coffee or going to lunch or something, and coming back. And usually for me, it takes like 30 minutes or so, depending on the size of, of the virtual machine that I'm trying to clone. Once it's finished its, its compilation process, and I kind of use the air quotes on that, it'll give you this package.box file. And essentially all that is is a clone of your VM, tarred, and it includes some metadata about the, the box itself. And, and that metadata is what Vagrant will use to figure out how to do whatever it needs to do with your particular box. When you call Vagrant box add, you can give it whatever name that you want to refer to that box by. It doesn't have to be the name that you used in VirtualBox. I mean, they can be the same, it doesn't matter. In addition, this package portion of the dot box, you can name whatever it is that you want. I kept it here because it was just simple and easier to talk about that way. Uh, Vagrant provides a really cool service in the Vagrant cloud where if you don't have VirtualBox and you don't have these VMs that you, you want to use yourself, you can go onto their website and browse through all kinds of virtual machines that are available to you. Uh, 
what you want to do is like if you've ever used Composer with PHP, you know, it usually has some a, a two-part identifier like this. Just find that identifier and make note of that because you'll need it later. In this particular case, we can use Vagrant Box Add, give it the identifier that we found on the Vagrant Cloud, and it'll automatically download, download that for us and give us the ability to share that across all of our projects. So in this particular case, we'd only have to download it a single time and we could reuse that, that particular VM across other projects. Uh, an important note is that boxes are cloned every time. So any changes that you make to a, to a VM instance that you spin up with this particular box are only going to be to that instance of the box. It won't be to your, the, the box that uh, Vagrant is managing. I hope that made sense. So it's cloned from the base one that you installed, not from the one that Hey, keep the questions by. till the end, pal. No, <laughs> sorry. So, say that one more time. So, so it's cloned from the one that you downloaded every single time, not from another one that you, you might have made from that and modified. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and the idea is that you can have this thing that you, that's disposable, right? That you don't really care that it, that it lives because you're going to use... Spun it up for that, used it, and threw it away. Correct. Yeah. So at the heart of Vagrant is this thing called a Vagrant file. And this Vagrant file is what you use to configure the virtual machine. Uh, it's Ruby syntax. So if you're not comfortable with Ruby, there's a bit of a learning curve uh, in terms of getting started with it. I mean, variables are a little different and um, variable assignments, variable assignment. It, it should, you should be able to pick it up rather quickly. The nice thing about the Vagrant file is that you can commit it with your source code. You can add it to your projects. When you do deployments, if you're doing them via SVN or CBS or GitHub and you're doing a tagging mechanism, you can include it with the tags, right? So if I know a particular release is good with PHP 5.3 and it may only work with PHP 5.3, I can include a Vagrant file with that. So what I'm getting at, it's very distributable. I could email it, uh, however you, you could put it on, a, on a, a wiki page. It's very compact and lightweight. So within a Vagrant file, everything needs to go Actually, I'll step back and talk about this first. So starting a project is pretty easy. Uh, you can go into an existing project, uh, or you can make your own directory project and start from scratch. And all you have to do is run Vagrant init. And Vagrant init will generate a Vagrant file for you. And it'll kind of come with a bunch of pre-configured notes and variable names that you need to fill out. So part of that, like not knowing Ruby, it, it's OK to an extent because it gives you a lot of that boilerplate already. If you know the name of the box that you want to use, you can provide the box name, and it'll already pre-configure that Vagrant file to spin up that, that box name already for you. There's three main components to the Vagrant file. The first is the config.vm. This is the container for all of the virtual machine related configurations. The host name is generally configured, um, will generally configure the, the host name of the box. It's, it's not required that it's there, but I would recommend adding a host name. Box URL is, is an easy way to reference a, a, a box that you put on some internal website or perhaps you put it on source control. I don't know if you necessarily would, would do it that way. Or you can make it publicly accessible through your own website and share it like that. So we, we saw how we could add a box via Vagrant Box Add. We don't necessarily have to do that. If we're deploying from the cloud, we can just add the cloud ID to the configuration vm.box. And when we start up Vagrant, it'll automatically download that box for us. So we don't have to go through that initial legwork. The problem with that is that it we then have to do that for each project that we want to spin up an instance that uses that box. And there's some cost uh, for that operation. Everything that we do within Vagrant from a configuration standpoint needs to go inside this Vagrant configure, do config, and end block. Right? 
If you don't do that, it's going to break. It won't work. So like I mentioned, you can use this box URL and I can put a make a box accessible on any public facing URL and then I can distribute my vagrant file and when when the the consumer of my vagrant file spins up their instance, it'll automatically download my box. Um, which is a nice feature, especially if you this might be this might be on an internal network or something like that where you don't want it pub, public facing. So we also have the ability to configure our network. So we could configure an array of, of forwarded ports if we want to. In this case, we're saying we want to port our 8080 port on our host machine to port 80 on our guest machine because we may want to allow people to access a cool website or something that we're building. We can give it a private network address. So for clustering machines or clustering VMs, we may want to be able to reference that by an internal, uh, an internal IP or an IP that, that we know ahead of time. And then the public network. So if you have multiple network adapters, you can tell Vagrant which adapter that it, it should use when it's spinning up the VM. Sync folders, by far one of my favorite features of Vagrant. So what sync folders allow us to do is essentially use our host machine and our normal development process like, like we would in any machine. So I could have five different Vagrant instances running, all mounted to a, the same development folder. And this is great for times where I need to check, is this working against PHP 5.3, 5.4, 5.5? I make those changes in my, in my normal development IDE, and then can test those instantly across my, my cluster of machines. Uh, additionally, it supports a couple um, types of ways to mount our sync folders. By default, it uses VirtualBox, I think VBOXFS. But we also get some other mounting capabilities, NFS, <coughs> Samba, and for deployment to cloud services, it uses rsync. This is an example up here of how we might configure that um, in a Vagrant file. We give it our, our source directory, which is the directory that lives on our host machine, the target directory that we want to target on the VM machine. So for instance, if I have an htdocs folder on my host machine, I may want to target the var www folder on the, the VM instance. And that's where I would define that. And then I give it the type. Now there's a bunch of sub options for each of these. Um, if, if you want to go, if this isn't going to fill your demands and you need some other parameters, uh, I would go to the to the Vagrant documentation and look those up. There are some additional uh, ways to configure uh, those types. By default, again, you have VBOXFS. It gives us some additional abilities for adding our source and destination directories. We can also configure our group and user permissions uh, and any other mount options that we want. So the other component to the configuration is SSH. Vagrant will not work without it. Right? Vagrant needs to be able to SSH into the box to do Vagrant related tasks like such as provisioning the box, which we'll get to in a second. A, the recommended way to do this is to provide the SSH username and some private key value. Um, you can provide an array of private keys. So if you're deploying this to multiple cloud versions, you might have different uh, different private keys for each of those different cloud services and you can just reference those here and it'll pull the proper key to log in. Additionally, if you wanted to, you could pass an SSH password. I wouldn't recommend that because kind of the whole benefit of this is this idea that we can distribute this Vagrant file. So I don't know if we really want to distribute something where we have our password baked into this, you know, baked into our configuration. Uh, additionally, if we have different port requirements, we can add that there. So by default, out of the box, Vagrant supports VirtualBox. But it's not the only provider that Vagrant, box, uh, Vagrant supports. It has support for VMware Fusion, uh, VMware Workstation, Docker, and there's a few others that, that wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, you're restricted to 
to one provider per machine. And what I mean by that is per box. So if I have a CentOS machine for digital, uh, digital oceans, for VMware or for VirtualBox, I can only have one instance of that running on a, on, on a provider at any given time. Um, to do that, you would say Vagrant up and you would say, okay, I want this provider to use, I want to use my VMware Fusion instance of that particular VM and I would pass it the VM uh, Fusion value there. Additionally, within the Vagrant file itself, I could say, set an environment variable that tells it to always load the VMware Fusion instance of that. So this gives me, again, that kind of distributable approach to saying, hey, always use VMware Fusion for this particular box, even though I have a virtual box instance and a Fusion box instance for this. Providers or provisioning. So Vagrant supports quite a few provisioners out of the box. And a provisioner is what's going to set up your config files, install software, uh, upgrade machines, and things like that. <laughs> Sorry. So it supports Puppet Labs, Ansible, CF Engine, Salt Stack, and Docker. Um, but for right now, I'm going to focus on the, the two providers that you may use in the beginning as you're getting started with uh, Vagrant. For me, I use the shell provisioner quite a bit. I use that to do database migrations. So I don't want to have to worry about going in and installing a database every time I roll up an instance. I want it to bring up the instance, install the database, and then run through a migration procedure. Because it may be a fresh schema install, I may have 20 versions that it needs to kind of cycle up on or there may be some sample data that I want loaded. And I can do that all through a provisioner, which again, it allows me to have this reproducible way to set up my machines. And that looks a little something like this. Uh, in this case, we are telling the VM provision, provisioner tool that we want to use a shell script. And then we give it some unique variable name. So in this case, we're just calling it S, did that so that it would fit on the slide a little easier. We give it the path to the shell script. So this path is, doesn't have to be relative to your project directory, but because you're distributing this, it probably would be. And then we can pass it any other arguments that, that we want into the shell script itself. Uh, additionally, you may use the, the file provisioner. So I may have like a directory of images that I want to make sure that it just gets copied over. I don't want to mount it because I don't really care that I'm not going to make modifications to that. I don't need to pick it up automatically. I just, every time this box runs, I want to copy whatever these files are over to the, to the virtual machine. There's also another really, really cool feature um, that, that Vagrant has, and that's the ability to define multiple machines. And for us, we need this because we have a web server running on one machine and we have a database server running on a different machine. And we could have a database master and a database slave, so we may have three machines that we need to test against. In this case, I can distribute one Vagrant file and when I start Vagrant up, it'll just spin up all three machines for me based off of whatever configuration options I provide here. So the, the format of the Vagrant file is just a little bit different in that case. So you can see we're still within the main configure loop but in this case, we're defining, we're defining a machine called web, and we're giving it the variable web. And then as we did config.vm.box, config.ssh.box before, now we're doing that within the context of, of that machine. And you keep that configuration within the initial define and the end block to spin up a single instance. So if I've defined multiple machines in a Vagrant file, I can just say, hey, I, I don't really need my database right now because I, I want to test some static files and I'll worry about that later. Like I could bring up just the web instance, right? Additionally, I could tell Vagrant, just never start my DB machine until I tell you to do that. So when I run Vagrant up, it'll just be off. And this is 
probably what you want if you're doing like DB master, DB slave type of configurations, because you want your master to come up first. You want to make sure that it's synced with data, and then you'll probably bring up your slave and you know make sure that it's doing it what it's supposed to do. Vagrant provides a command line interface to interact with your machines. Um, it's a pretty pretty simple way to do that. You change into your project directory, you run Vagrant up, and it'll spin up your machine. It's that simple. You don't really have to do anything else. Just Vagrant up makes it happen. The, the counter to that is Vagrant destroy. So when we no longer want to consume the system resources, disk space, and memory, we call Vagrant dis destroy and it completely removes it from our system. So we get our memory back, we get our disk space back. Um, and the next time we need it, we just run Vagrant up. It, it handles configuring that machine exactly the way we want it. And it'll come back exactly the way we configured it every time across any machine. And that's pretty cool. There might be times where you want to free up some system resources, um, but you don't want to destroy the, 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 the VM because you're not done working with it. So maybe you've kind of reached the limit of virtual machines that you have running on your box. I know I certainly get there a lot and I've got to suspend things. So what this will do is it will take the current running state, it'll capture the current running state of your virtual machine and essentially write it to disk. So it does take a little more disk allocation. I mean, disk space, everybody has probably more than they need today. So it's not, in my opinion, it's not such a big problem. Um, and again, the nice part about that is I can do resume when I want to work with it again, and it brings it back to exactly where it was when I left off. And if you're juggling a lot of uh, virtual machines the way I am, I think you'll find that as a very useful feature because the, the up operation, it takes a while to spin that instance up. It's like sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. It really depends on the size of your, of your virtual machine that you're working with. Vagrant halt is equivalent to like the graceful shutdown. So it'll attempt to, to basically spin down your VM. Uh, it's still there, it's still consuming like disk, disk resources, but it'll free up some of your CPU and, and memory usage. There's Vagrant Reload. So Vagrant Reload is equivalent to running up and, or sorry, halt and up at the same time. You'll use this a lot as you're, especially when you're getting started with Vagrant um, and you're making modifications to the Vagrant file, you'll do a Vagrant Reload and it'll pull in your changes. So invoking provisioning. So when does your, when does your virtual machine actually get provisioned? When you run Vagrant up for the first time, it'll run through all of that uh, provisioning for you. So it'll install the software, it'll configure your, your configuration files, and it'll do all, that, all, that, all those tasks for you. The next time you run Vagrant up, it's not going to bother with that. It's just going to start up your virtual machine because it knows it's already been configured. So it's smart enough and keeps its state and figures that out. If for whatever reason you want to force that provisioning, you just pass the double provision. Uh, the double hyphen provision flag to Vagrant up and it'll rerun your provisioners for you. Additionally, you could just say Vagrant provision. Like you already have a machine that's running and you want to run those provisioners again, you just say log out Vagrant provision and it'll just execute your provisioners for you. And, and lastly, you can run Vagrant reload, which is equivalent again to running halt and up, double hyphen provision, just passes that to up and It'll, it'll provision that machine again for you. Accessing the machine is really, really simple. You change into your project directory, you run Vagrant SSH, and it'll just log you in. Right? There may be times where you just want to perform a simple task. So you pass it the dash C flag here, which says, I just want to run a command, and that's it. Just run that command and return. So I put the dash C flag. In this case, I want to list the contents of the Vagrant directory. And I can do that. I don't have to bother logging in. I can stay in my, in my working directory and, and everything's cool. Something that I use a lot, I've got my own MySQL management tools, um, but I want to see or inspect the database on my virtual machine. I can pass commands into SSH by using double hyphen here. And any of, this, any of these commands will get passed directly to the, to the SSH. And in this, in this particular case, I'm creating a tunnel uh, from port 4, 4, 430, 
from 3306 on the, the local host of the guest machine to 4321 on my host machine. So now I can just log into my MySQL database on my host machine on that port and do whatever it is I need to do. And so if I have multiple machines, I, I don't really use 4321. I use a different scheme, but it's not that much more advanced. I use 1001, 1002, and I kind of name the machines in that way. So it's easy for me to guess the port numbers as I need to inspect database values. I think you'll find that this will be very, very helpful uh, as you start managing your, your vagrant instances. Oftentimes, you may want to know what the running status of a virtual machine is, um, especially when I come back like from a meeting, a project meeting, and I'm trying to get back to work. I may not know, did I spin that instance up when I left, or what is the current state of that? Did I... Did I halt it or, or whatever. So I can go into my working direct into my project directory, run vagrant status, and it'll tell me the status of the machine. Additionally, I can run vagrant global status. And this is pretty cool because I can do this anywhere from the command line interface. Right? I don't have to be in my project directory to do this. And it'll give me a list of all of the different uh, versions of my virtual machines that I have running. And it's important to take note here of this identifier. So we can use this identifier to run all those other commands I just talked about with adding this identifier to the end. So in this particular case, if I need to log in for whatever reason to my PHP 5.6 instance, from anywhere in the terminal, I just say vagrant SSH, I take that identifier, I pass it into, into the command, hit enter, and it'll automatically log me in. Um, I find that I use this all the time because I can't be bothered to type out directories from the terminal all the time. It, it just, it's a huge pain. So back to the Vagrant Cloud. I would highly recommend that if you're gonna use Vagrant to do your virtualization, you sign up for an account. It's totally free. Um, it's only a little bit of information. They never spam me. I, and I'm not a vagrant, you know, evangelist in any way. I don't work for them. I'm not associated with vagrant. Um, but you get a couple really cool features. One is if you don't really need your box to be private, you can just upload it to their cloud. And so no matter where you are, you have access to that. So let's say you're at work. Of course, you never share anything across like your work and your home because that would be, I wouldn't advocate that, right? Panasonic doesn't. Look, looks down, but say you were going to do something like that, you might email yourself a vagrant file that's pointing to some instance on the cloud that you can then take onto your home machine, run vagrant up, and now you have a totally replicated environment from the one that you were working on at home. I, but, but yeah, don't share between your, your home. What? How big are the The vagrant instances themselves? Yeah. Uh, it really depends. Because it's pulling it down. Over the internet. It's pulling it down over the internet, but yeah, it, it really depends. I mean, it could be a, a very like micro instance, like 300 megabytes, or I have a couple VM instances that are gigabytes because I've got some like a ton of, of data that they're kind of encapsulated. So it, it depends on what it is that you want to do. I would recommend just keeping it super lightweight and bare bones because that's why you have provisioners, mm -hmm. right? Especially if you're distributing them, just keep them as lightweight as you can and then use the provisioners to like install the software and install any other like file dependencies and stuff that you need. So now that we have a Vagrant Cloud account, we can also do some other really neat things. Um, and this isn't a feature, I didn't really discover this feature until recently, and I've, I've used it all the time since then. Um, but before we can do that, we have to log in. We just type in Vagrant Login. It asks for our username and password. And then we can do things like Vagrant Share. So I have a web server that's running on my machine, but I can't be bothered to look at what my IP address is because maybe it's like DHCP, it's constantly changing, and it's a drag every time I either get back on the Wi-Fi network or I, I plug in. What happens here is I run Vagrant Share, and Vagrant will then give us a URL. And we can send this to anyone we want, and it'll automatically map into the Vagrant instance that we're targeting. And that's really cool because now it's seconds. I can, hey, look at this cool feature I just put in, Vagrant Share, get a link, pass it to my coworkers or pass it to my colleagues on the internet, 
and they could instantly be interacting with my virtual machine. Additionally, there are other features where you can use this to log in, like SSH in to that virtual machine and do any types of management. So maybe you're hung up on a problem and your buddy in, in Germany, you know, Germans are pretty smart, he knows the answer to that problem. He's kind of frustrated because he can't walk you through it. You say, here's this link, I want to share SSH into this box. He can then go in and do whatever it is that he needs to do with it. Um, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty cool. That brings us to Puppet. Or Puff, Puff, Puppet, Puff, PHP, et, whatever. Has anyone heard of, of Puppet? Okay. So, yeah, all this stuff that I just described to you, you don't need to know it. <laughs> yeah. So, Puppet is a GUI that basically walks us through this setup process. It's a wizard that we can use, and we just enter the configuration values we want, and it outputs a Vagrant file with some Puppet modules and a YAML configuration file. And so this handles like all of our provisioning and like how we would set up getting this virtual machine up and running for us. It does all the hard work. So again, you, you didn't really need to know any of that nonsense. I probably should have just started with this. Um, it was started by uh, Juan Tremino, I think about a year ago, uh, maybe two years ago. Um, I've just recently started contributing to Puffet. Um, and I'll explain it as I, as I do a quick walkthrough of the tool, but there's some features that I need that the tool doesn't have, and so I'm trying to help them uh, help it get introduced. I did submit a pull request, but then discovered after community feedback that there's a lot of other features that, that they now want to be tacked on to that particular, uh, my, my feature request. Um, so let me walk you through that real quick. Let's use it. the wrong way. So this is, I have to kind of twist this way, contort myself a little bit because of, of my position here. But this is it. This is the GUI. Super simple. It allows us to deploy to DigitalOcean, Rackspace, and Amazon Web Services. So that's an awesome feature. I gave a, a talk on asynchronous PHP earlier this morning. Excuse me. And I created an instance with DigitalOcean because I had a bunch of PHP extensions and some other things that I wanted the participants of that talk to be able to, to play with and use themselves. But who has the time to go through and track down these extensions and figure out how to get them installed and deal with, with the issues of compiling PHP or other extensions? So I was able to do that by creating a configuration targeting DigitalOcean, but in addition, bit making a few modifications, easily share that with GitHub. So now it's in a GitHub repo that you could download and run Vagrant up and be able to play with all these neat examples. I'm gonna focus strictly on, on the local instance right now. Um, we can target our provider. So right now there's, there's not a full list of providers. It's an open source project, so it's kind of being added on an as-needed basis uh, if we're lucky enough to get people that contribute back. We can choose a few flavors and these will have some PHP options kind of pre-available to us. So if you've really been wanting to mess around with HHVM, I know I certainly am after seeing Sarah's talk, like I can go here and, and download a, a Vagrant instance just bare bones with HHVM and, and just start hacking around. And I can make I, I can mount it to any folder I want on my host machine, and when I'm done messing around, just destroy the box. Maybe I'll play with it later. This is where you'll give it a local VM address. Um, if you're only running one or two, uh, unless this conflicts with some other internal IP address, usually you're pretty fine with leaving that as the default. Uh, the same with the memory. I mean, memory is kind of a, a a valuable resource on our machine, so I doubt you really need anything more than 512 megabytes. I mean, that's that's a lot for some people that are still running like two or three, four gigs. Um, 
And you can tell it the number of, of CPUs you want to use, or the CPUs you want to simulate, uh, which is, is pretty cool. Additionally, I can pre-configure some ports, some local forwarding ports, um, and I can add kind of as many as I want, right? I could have uh, 8080 on my host machine here, port over to port 80 on my guest machine. This is where I configure my, my folder syncing. So in my case, I have... I know it's kind of weird to do it that way, but that's what I have. And I target a var dub dub uh, folder on my guest machine. And I can pick between the different syncing types, right? And what's really nice about this is if you're not exactly sure what these what these things are, just mouse over the, uh, well, okay. That didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. <laughs> Normally it gives you a nice little box, but it's not gonna do in this case, so I'm not gonna click it again. Let's see if I can get one of them to pop up. There we go. So most of them will do this. It'll give you a, a nice little synopsis of what that feature does and why you should concern yourself with it. Maybe it's important, maybe it's not. Server packages. So this is where I would put in the packages that I want to configure. Um, for me, the first thing I always do is I make sure that Vim is installed because when it's not, it's, it's kind of annoying. Um, so I'd recommend doing that if, if you're comfortable on the command line and logging into your box. It'll make your life a little easier when you want to make some, some local modifications on the guest. But any other packages that you might want on there, like I may want live event devel if I'm doing any live event related stuff in PHP. Uh, I need the header files in order to, to compile the, um, the PHP extension. There's some there's some folders that will come as part of the output where you can put your doc files. So any of your like uh, Vim RC files, things you want to carry over just automatically to your, to your guest machine, you can put in there any scripts. So there's a, a run once um, run always folders where you can drop shell scripts and it'll just automatically execute those for you. Firewall rules. So by default, and it, I think it tells you somewhere, oh, maybe it doesn't. By default, port 22, port, port 80, and I think port 443 are exposed. It's important to know that if you're downloading from Puppet or even running a Vagrant instance, uh, because if you want to expose another port, like for me, I was doing a lot of WebSocket stuff, so I was like port 80 for a web server, port 8080 for, uh, for my WebSocket stuff you'd want to make sure and configure that ahead of time because otherwise you'll scratch your head trying to figure out why you're not getting a, a, an upgrade on your WebSocket connection, for instance. So here we can say, I want to add 8080 and give it some rule. And this is really just a priority in terms of, of where it is in the chain. If you've ever had to mess with IP tables, trust me, you want to use this because I never freaking remember what those commands are. And, you know, thankfully with Evernote, I've got little cheat sheets that I use now, but uh, you can tell it how you, how you want it to, to, to configure that with IP tables. This is pretty cool. So we can choose between Apache and Nginx. Um, for me, I've been trying to switch all of my stuff away from Apache onto Nginx, uh, just because there's some features that I like. I like how, it, how it's configured. I like some of the the ease of doing reverse proxying and clustering and things like that. Um, the reverse proxy stuff is the stuff that I'm working on getting added right now. So if that's something that you do, then come back in maybe a month or when I get time to, to circle back uh, to, to address some of the other changes that the community is asking for, um, it will be available here. Um, there's some limitations that I'm trying to work through in terms of the puppet modules that are being used with that as well. But at least from a basic support standpoint, I hope to have reverse proxying in there. And reverse proxying is nice when you want to do things like route, use port 80 and route WebSocket requests to some other process, right? So I might have a WebSocket server running on port 8080, but I still want to leverage port 80 because I don't want to expose port 8080 for whatever reason. I had to do that for the session earlier because uh, this place, UCI doesn't, doesn't allow you to, to use a different ports. 
So I can choose which one I want to use. In this case, I can say just install Nginx, and I can move on to languages. Now, what's really cool about this is that I'm no longer restricted, even though it's like puff it, puff, puff, het, put, whatever it's called. I can configure other languages. Ruby, um, Python was just added a couple weeks ago. I can get Node.js, and I can I can pick whatever languages I want. You don't just have to pick one, right? So for my talk, I was doing a lot of preparation with comparisons between PHP and Node.js, and this was a great opportunity for me to, now that I'm done, I can just destroy all the Node.js stuff and not have to look, look at it again for a while. Um, but if I wanted Node.js, I could put it here. I can add any of the, the, uh, the modules I want, like if I wanted request or socket IO or any of those types of modules, I can add that. Same with Python. Um, additionally with Ruby, not very applicable to us. Um, PHP. So I can go down here and tell it what, what Peckle files uh, that I want. Uh, let's see, live event probably isn't going to work. Let's say, uh, let's say I wanted to, to play around with Redis. I can say, okay, I want you to load the Redis extension for me. Um, there may be some, some pair modules. It's not recommended that you load PHP unit anymore uh, via pair. You should use Composer for that, apparently, or just download it, download the FAR file. But you can do all that like custom configuration that you need here. Additionally, if there's any uh, modules that you need loaded, you can just add them right there as well. Debugging tools. I want to install xdebug. For me, this is primarily development machines. I would turn that off if I was deploying to a production instance, um, like to the cloud, for instance. I wouldn't want xdebug running on my production code. But for my local development and remote debugging, it makes it super simple. I just configure that. When I, when I want to work with my, um, I don't know if you can see this little bug up here, but it's just a, it's just a, a browser plug into Chrome. I can put it in debug mode, and if it's connected to a server, it'll just automatically kick up in my IDE, and I can start walking through my code and, and fixing any issues. So if you haven't messed with Xdebug, this might be a great opportunity for you to do that, because I, I guarantee you it'll help you uh, become a better coder. And what IP address is the puppet for that? The VM has its own IP, or? So the VM is. Confused with the, with the NAT. It, in my opinion, it doesn't get confused. It just works. Yeah. So if I'm connected to a site that's on that IP, then it'll just kick up. Yeah, it picks it up. Uh, here you can choose the databases you want installed. Again, you don't have to just pick one. You can pick as many as you want. For me, I've been doing a lot of messing around with Redis as I'm trying to do this like really fast stores between uh, a standard PHP you know, FPM process and this idea of a, a long running like WebSocket server written in PHP. So all the session management being pushed to Redis and doing that communication that way. Uh, mail catcher is, is not something that I use, but I have used the RabbitMQ instance quite a bit. I'm, I'm pushing right now to get Kafka. So if anybody's familiar with Kafka or been doing anything with Kafka, it's Apache's kind of message queue system. I'd like to get that in there because I want to start playing with it. So you may see that within maybe the coming months, depending on how much time my, my children allow me to have to, to, to play with this kind of stuff. So once I've done all that, I just tell it to create my configuration. I'll show you what that looks like real quick. I know we're running out of time. Where did my mouse go? Here we go. So we have our Vagrant file. It's putting everything over here. Just give me one sec. So you can see here, it put a bunch of these different weird variables and stuff. What does that stuff mean? It's total nonsense. The key to take out of this is that it put all of these things within this vagrant uh, configure block. And actually, probably what's better to do here is this. Let me go back quickly.
So we'll put all of those values in this config.yaml file. Super easy to read, pretty self-explanatory on the variable naming. Any place that has this kind of array syntax where they're unique IDs, you see this special value there. Those are all supposed to be unique. You can go in here and modify this file. It's not going to break anything. So it's super easy to make modifications to your, to your virtual machine. And if it doesn't work, just Control-Z back out and do a vagrant up again until it does. Um, there are some, some challenges, especially with the PHP extensions, which are here. Like, for instance, I can't configure working with beta versions of Peckle extensions. So if I want to do live event, and I think 0MQ is still, still in beta, it's not like stable. I would have to go in here and do something like channel peckle.php.net zmq-1.0.1 or, .1 or I don't know, I don't remember what the actual values are, but I could do something like that and it'll actually bring that down and provision that for me. All right, so you, you may want to know that. Don't get frustrated if there's certain things you can't do because you can always go into this configuration file and, and mucks around with whatever it is you want to do. If you see something like, for instance, you originally downloaded this, but you want HHPM support, just go in here, put a one, and it'll install it the next time you provision. That easy. You don't have to do a vagrant destroy and vagrant up again. You just run the provisioner command, and you'll have HHPM, and you can play with it. And yeah. So one last thing, and we can call it quits here. So we see these folders here. This makes it really easy for me to say, okay, here's my dot .files. I just put them in the dot .file folder. I want this to execute every time I run Vagrant up. That's where I put those files. Every time uh, I provision a machine for the first time, I would put them in the, in the once directory. Every time I start up or one time, the first time I start up, I could put some scripts there too. So for me, my database migration script actually goes in the, the startup always. So every time I start up, I want to see, I want to make sure that I sync with my local development to see if there's been any database modifications at all. And so for us, we, we keep schema files and we keep um, migrations and physical files uh, that our code base knows how to translate. And I just reference that script and it makes sure that I'm always in sync every time I, I restart or, or fire up an instance. Any questions? We kind of had question and answer as we went. Uh, so on that share, is it like creating like a tunnel so that you're on side, you're on a local network, and but it's actually sharing via the um, cloud site? My guess is this. My guess is they're doing some type of, of reverse proxying, mm -hmm. right? So they're exposing. I haven't actually looked into it, and that's a great question because I was thinking about the same thing. Like I said, I just recently found out about how they're doing that. My guess is that to, to bypass, like for me, I've got Cox Communications, and so they, they block a lot of, of standard ports. Like I can't run a web server because they block port 80. The way to get around that is you just spin up some like large port number, right? And now all of a sudden you can connect. So my guess is what they're doing is spinning up that large port number, telling the cloud what that port number is. The cloud is doing a reverse proxy into that port number, and the internal vagrant knows how to route that into the proper box. Total conjecture. But if I was going to do it, that's how I would do it. But, it, but you've used it on a large network where it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And surprise it. To, to my astonishment, it's actually worked. <laughs> yeah. It just worked. And I, I didn't expect that to happen the first time. Any other questions? I know some of you are falling asleep. It's, you know, going through configuration files is not a lot of fun. But I hope what you got out of this is that there are ways to, to use this to really improve your development. Um, I can I can attest personally that for me it's changed the way that I do development. It's changed the way that I've interacted with a lot of the functionality within PHP itself because now it's super painless to, to do that. I can if there's a new extension I want to play around with. I go into that file and I add that extension, and if I decide wow that's not really going to work with me, it's not very stable. I either file bugs against the the extension maintainer, um, or I just trash the instance. It's totally it, it's totally free. It costs me nothing. So anyway, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And hope to, I, I, I hope to talk to some of you over beers and figure out.